Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ICG's Digital Academy webinar series. I'm Sally Alsop, the ICG committee member responsible for running our webinar program. So for today's webinar, we're delighted to welcome former ICG member, Dr. Gillian Ney, founder of the Social Intelligence Lab. Gillian is a digital behavioral scientist and the first person in the UK to have a PhD in social media. Her personal research has focused on creating methodologies to help businesses understand what drives customer behavior by applying behavioral science to social data and other personal data sources. She firmly believes that there is more to digital data than what current tools and ana analytical approaches provide. Gillian has spent her career working to overcome these limitations to add a layer of behavioral science in the analysis and interpretation of digital data. This additional, additional layer of insight consistently provides superior marketing intelligence for her clients. During her presentation, Gillian will share, uh, share with us some background into different social media listening tools, and then she'll run through a number of case studies demonstrating where the value of social data lies. As usual, there'll be a Q&A session at the end of Gillian's talk, so please type your questions into the question box as we go along, and I'll read them out when she has completed her presentation. So we're really grateful to Made in Studios for sponsoring this webinar. The Made in Surveys group is uh, an expert partner in market research fieldwork with offices and stunning viewing facilities in London, Paris, Birmingham, Lille and Lyon. So before I hand over to Gillian, here are the next webinars and online lunch and learn events to note down in your diaries. And don't forget that we're able to offer great value sponsorship opportunities with each of our webinars. Sponsorship normally costs £100 for a lot of exposure on our website, mailers and social media, and of course on the day. So please contact Lucy if you'd like to know more. So uh, our speaker today is Gillian May, uh, and I shall now hand over to Gillian. Thank you, Sally. Hi, everyone. I am just waiting to get control over the screen. Here we go. There we are. Brilliant. Can you all see my my screen? Okay. It's that just looks a... very clear. That looks super. Brilliant. Thank you, Sally. So hello, everyone. Um, it is nice to be back with the ICG. Um, and today, as Sally mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about social listening. So when I spoke to Sally and Lucy about this webinar, it all very much centred, the conversation centred on social listening technologies, which we know is largely a big part of the start of conversations when people are looking to analyse social data, but it's actually not the right questions that you should be asking. So I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into so some social tools and they're starting to diversify and splinter out into their own niches now. Um, so we'll give you some information on there, some hints and tips on how to buy them as well. But also I think the main thing for me and the thing that we, we focus on really at the Social Intelligence Lab is that to actually be able to get insights from social data, it's more about the people in the process. So we'll, I'm going to give you some examples of some great work that has happened in the area too, because a lot of the time people, they, they just don't know what's possible with social data. So that's why I'm here to help champion that. Okay, so, Let's get started here. So as Sally kindly mentioned, I am Dr. Gillian Nay. So my background had been in analysing social data um, after my PhD for quite a number of years, and I did that for market research purposes. But uh, going, the industry for me has always been made up of lots of different technology companies within the social data space. And I think that that's quite dangerous because then it becomes a technology 
technological solution rather than a research solution. So I started the Social Intelligence Lab to become that central meeting point for when people want to find out more information about social data analysis, to build out best practices and to really champion the industry and show people what is possible. So I am really delighted to be here today. So just to give you a quick rundown on the Social Intelligence Lab, we do help our members to plan, create and deliver successful social intelligence programmes. To, and from my view, to put it simply, to move from what we describe, what people describe as social listening to what we call social intelligence. Now, the language in this area is about to change again and you're going to hear a lot more about conversational intelligence, which will become really important and I'll show you why in a, in a few slides time. So we, we support our members through uh, training and research. We also keep a tools and agencies directory, and we also support different events and webinars and just generally champion the industry. So today, what we're going to cover is a quick look at social data analysis tools, the considerations that you need to have for when you're choosing a tool, uh, I'm going to explore social listening and what's the difference between social listening and social intelligence. And I will also look at different examples of social intelligence research. So it would, is, does, Sally, does the chat function work here? Because it would just be good to, to know who's already working in the area, what people's opinions on social data are. Is, is it possible we can do that? If you have the chat functionality or even the Q&A functionality there, um, I'm happy to take questions also. Um, please pop in and just let me know what you think about this area and you know, what you're hoping to learn. So let's start with the different social data analysis technologies. Now, I mentioned before that these technologies are starting to kind of splinter into more niche groups. So we have this social intelligence field which has been made up from these big social listening platforms. So these are the big generalist platforms that many of them have been about for kind of 10 to 14 years now. So we're talking about people like Talkwalker and Brandwatch and Digimind. They do lots and lots of different things and they kind of sit above the industry and they, and they work in many, many different applications. But what we're also finding now is that there's this other kind of bucket of tools that are coming out and they're more audience intelligence focused. So they're really heavily looking at who is sharing the information. We're starting to see links between the social intelligence and the audience intelligence now. So we can begin to understand the audience and then what it, the differences and how they're speaking about all of these topics that we want to do the social listening on. Taking it a massive step further, we've got these text analytics solutions. So these are people like NetBase Quid, Conversion and Word Nerds, and they use um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to really start to analyse the text. Now, I have to say is coming, being a researcher myself and coming from a background where I like to manually analyse everything, I always had a bit of apprehension against these text analytics platforms. I think it was largely driven by my by my experience within some of the, the social the social intelligence platforms because they said that they had AI too. And when I went to an, use that AI, it would never, ever, ever provided me with the segmentation that I would want to be able to answer the questions that I was looking to answer. Whereas these text analytics platforms, we can begin to build out um, bespoke models that are specifically for us. And then there's other models that have been built, uh, that have already been built for, that work across different industries. So there, these ones here, if you're looking for something that's a bit more automated, I would say that the social listening platforms are probably not the ones to go to because it's not real AI yet. Um, whereas these text analytics platforms, you're going to get more of that AI focus in here. The next one, which can cut people again, is these social suites. So they've been largely built out and they started life as social media management platforms. And then they started to build other elements in there. And social listening is one of the elements. So sometimes, we can find that particularly Agora Pulse is at a great price point in comparison to all of these other technologies that's on this screen here. But it might be that if you're looking to get really serious with the social data, that there's 
that there's differences in how you can download the data for analysis or the analysis functionality on the platform. So my advice, if you're looking to compare different technologies, is understand the history of that technology and how it became, how it came to life. Because if you're looking at something in these social suites, it's probably highly likely that they're not going to have all of the features and functionality that you're looking for, but they'd probably be at a, a better price. Now, when it comes to tech, this seems quite confusing. So I'll leave it on the screen for a few minutes um, while we're while we're talking here for you to understand. Like I said, as I said, a lot of the conversations in this area become about what technology are you using, and the the choice for technology it can be very it can be very complicated so what we've found is that there's kind of few different things that we need to look for here so the this this one here in the blue these are the different purchase factors so as i mentioned in the slide before we've got different types of technologies coming through is there any other type of difference between those between the products that you're looking at if you're looking at these general social listening tools, then I would say probably not. Some of them will try to argue that they have more Facebook and Instagram data than others, but they should all be running from the same API. So they should also have the same API access. And anyone that is getting data beyond that is taking it in a way that has not been, that, 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 that's outside the terms and conditions of Facebook and Instagram. So I would be wary of that. The next thing which is super important for everyone is get into the mindset that you don't just want to buy a social listening tool. You need to know what you want to use it for. So if it's for hardcore questions, like a lot of research is, then you're looking for something that allows you the flexibility to be able to download the data set. We've got things like speed to, speed to value, ROI and in the scale that that needs to take on as well. So we've got some folks that we work with that are in charge of global social intelligence functions. So in, from brands like Mondelez and L'Oreal and Pepsi and places like that, they need something that's going to be able to scale up. Whereas if we're independent researchers, then we need something that can align with how, how our work comes in and out. Um, a lot of the time, these companies, they want you to have a year long license. And I understand that that is probably not possible for everyone listening just now. We're trying to work out another way to be able to help and give people part licenses. Um, but there's also the ability to go and partner with other agencies who specialize within this type of research. And there is also a wealth of freelancers out there as well. Um, we are currently working on building a freelancer bank um, so people can get access to good quality freelancers, but um, we're a few months off that happening, but, but stay tuned for that. We've also kind of got other things coming along here, so requirement building. As I mentioned, that you don't just want to think about this as buying a social listening tool. You really need to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, do some research. So there are sites like, um, review sites like G2, where there's lots of different reviews from folks. Some of them are interesting and some of them are not, because obviously everybody goes to their customers and asks them to put a review out there. We do keep at the Social Intelligence Lab a directory of different tools and agencies. Um, the next issue on, on top of that will be the freelancers. But you can you can go and search to see what is out there on the market. I would say go and start to ask people about the different technologies. I'd also say when you go to do a demo, it's all set up, it all looks really shiny, but it's never quite as simple as that when you go to analyze the data yourself. So try, if you can, to get a free a, a free trial um, or at least be able to go in and explore one of their preset dashboards so you can go in and have a look to see what the flow and the functionality is like. And in the next slide, there's specific areas when you're assessing these different technologies that you really, really need to consider. So this is a bit of a blueprint in terms of what generally happens when we're speaking to enterprise customers. So there's lots of different people um, that need to be considered in there. It might be slightly easier for you um, because you've not got uh, you've not got 4,000 people that you need to understand what their needs are as well. So how to choose your tool. I keep on mentioning this, but it's super important. Decide on your goals. So what what type of questions are you answering? What what does what does your general research look like? 
when people start to talk to us about doing social listening research that have come from a research and insights background, they tend to come and say, can we do a bit of social listening on this? That's kind of the wrong thing to do as well, because we find that there's a misalignment between what it is that you're hoping to achieve and the type of output that you're looking for and what actually can happen with social data research, which is why I want to show you some of the, the, great, um, the great examples of work there so you can get better understanding of where this can fit into your research set as well. When you're choosing the tool, however, I mentioned before, find out about the tool background. How did that tool start? Was it a social listening technology? Was is it always been an audience analysis technology? Was it a social suite? Are, are they text analytics? And that's what they've, that's where they've came from and can now analyse social data. What's becoming super important here as well, there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions in this industry just now, and a lot of the bigger tools like Brandwatch and Linkfluence have now been bought over by other companies. So their technologies are more than likely going to be integrated with other technologies which that, um, from the companies that bought them, which means that there's going to be a slight upheaval in terms of the platform and what data might be able to access and what features and functionality are coming out. So you need to understand who owns that product and if there is some kind of roadmap for that um, and being integrated into other technologies, because it can get, we've heard from some folks that we work with um, that there have been certain issues. And then please check on, on what the future roadmap looks like as well. For everyone here, I want to give a bit of insight into how I think about kind of data. When we're looking at things like data coverage, all of these solutions are going to tell you they've got 300 million sources of data, which is a lot of data, but we need to start thinking about where those data sources come from. So not all social data is created equal. You're going to get different things from Facebook and Instagram data to Twitter data to Reddit data to forums. You can also analyze review sites. And then there's also the ability for a lot of these tools now that you can upload other data sets. So you could take your um, call center transcripts or you could take chatbot transcripts. You could take your focus group transcript or your interview transcript and you can upload all that in there and analyze it within the one platform because it's all analyzing language-based data. So check out what these look like. For the researchers that we work with, what we've also found is that most people, while they have access to the technologies, more this general social listening technologies, is that they do not analyze the data on the platform. They take the data off the platform and analyze it in spreadsheets. But there's slight changes in how all of these platforms allow you to download the data. So that data export and what the cap on that is also super important for when, if you're going to be doing research yourself. I don't know about the language that you you tend to analyse in and things like that, but we're finding that we're, there's lots more global based projects now. So you need to have a look to see what that language coverage is also like. And then if there's particular data sources within each of these different countries and things that are going to be really important that you access. Not Although people will say they've got 300 million data sources, they do not access every single data source. So you need to do a bit of comparing and contrasting on what data sources are important for you. So it may be that you work within a niche, so you, you know more about um, where people are going to talk about specific subjects, or you might need to do some research upfront to figure out where the important data sources are. I put in integrations here. So if we're doing things in social listening technologies, but we want to understand more about their audiences, we would have to move more into that audience analysis tool set. So the integration between technologies is becoming super important as this type of research becomes more rigorous and we can start to do more things with it. So always check the, the what integrations are available, if you can import and export data, because it will become, it will become important as your maturity in analysing social data increases. The final one that I've got in here just now is compliance. What we're finding is that there's certain, because there's very little difference between a lot of the generalist social listening technologies, is they try to compete on we get access to more data, which 
is is not always right. So when we're talking about Facebook and Instagram data, they have an API that everybody is supposed to access if they want to take data from the platform. If someone has more Facebook or Instagram data, they're taking the data in a way that is not intended by the platforms. So they could be subject to um, to investigation and legal activity, and they may be taken off the platform altogether. So when we're talking about compliance, we want to understand a bit more about how they access these different data sources. Data crawling is not illegal, um, and you will find that some are, are crawling uh, different data sources like your forums and things like that because they need to do that. But when it comes to these big social networking sites like your Twitters and your Facebooks and Instagrams and people like that, there is an API access there. And we would always say to make sure that they're accessing via the API. When you're working with big enterprise clients, they're starting to switch more on about this compliance and regulation. Um, we've even heard from some folks from the WPP group that if the, if the tools crawl, um, they, they, they're not allowed to purchase them through procurement. So it's when you're working with other people, it's always you need to understand where the compliance is and then what the compliance of the technology that you're using is. It's still very much a great area. And while I'm saying that Facebook and everyone have their APIs, it's not illegal to crawl, but it is against the terms and conditions and it can get the vendors into a bit of hot water. So please do check that one out. Now, I mentioned before as well that the conversations that we have always seems to start with what tools and technologies are you using, which is good because they give us access to the data. But when we go through the sales process with these technologies, we they tell you that you're going to find all of this insight and it just comes at the magical touch of a button, but it's not always like that. There's certain things like data quality issues um, which results in the noise. So sometimes there can be 100,000 retweets, which gives you 100,000 individual pieces of data. Um, we find that there's spam coming through. There's things because we're working with language and how Boolean operators work, that you're pulling in more data than you need to. Um, so we need to understand a bit, kind of think about the data quality, which goes back to my earlier point and think about what data sources are important to you and what it is that you want to be doing with the research. Um, we did a study, um, this study was in 2019, with everything that happened last year, we didn't run it again last year because people were in a state of flux. But from that study that we did last year, we found that 67% of people who analyse social data are analysing off platform. And it's mostly because they can't get the functionality of the technology to work for the questions it is that they're trying to answer. I would imagine for all the researchers listening, that you would probably fall in within the same segment here and that you're going to want to um, export that data so you can create your own um, segmentation categories and encode it that way. Um, again, coming back to that, the data export is, is very, very important. But when people are being led by the technologies, they're being led by the functionality that's available on those technologies. So certain things tend to then increase in importance, but actually don't make a very big impact on the work that you're doing. So an example of this would be sentiment. When we're doing social data analysis, we always hear in, in um, briefs that people want to understand the sentiment. It seems to be a really important, a really important thing for them. But having things buckages into positive, negative and neutral is not always going to provide the insight that you're looking for, nor the full value of what is possible with social data. So while it's there and it's within all of these platforms, it's also not the most reliable. In fact, it's probably the, the least reliable analysis that's, that's there within the platforms. So you're talking probably between 60 and 80 percent accuracy within that sentiment. It increases slightly when you're working with the, the text analytics platforms because you've got the ability to train the data yourself. So the program learns. But within a lot of these other ones, the, the sentiment's just not there. So what happens is researchers, when we go in to double check it, it's all wrong. So we think it's a load of rubbish and put it to the side. So the conversations, again, think about how we're going to approach this and you know, work it manually. Another big one that we hear about a lot is what's the shade of voice? 
again, it's limiting what is possible with social data research. Um, so we need to kind of try to educate about what is possible. We do get a lot of incoming inquiries because people are looking to add a social listening component onto the research that they're doing. What tends to happen with those projects is we hear we want to do a bit of social listening. There doesn't seem to be a, a question to answer or, or there's a there's a bones of a question to answer, but it's more along the lines of I want to know what people are talking about about this specific topic, which again comes back to that share of voice. So when we're then trying to pair the client with an agency or a freelancer that can do that work, there's a big disconnect in between what the freelancer or agency thinks that the project should be and what the client actually wants to see. And it's mostly because they don't understand what is possible with social data. I want to touch upon this as well, very quickly. Now, I've interchanged between different different terms here. I've spoken about social listening, I've spoken about social intelligence, but, but conversational intelligence. There is a slight difference between these things. And at the Social Intelligence Lab, we're going to start educating more in this. So for us, social listening is the process of tracking mentions of a brand product or competitor or um, keyword, whatever that is online. And you're probably likely to do a bit of What's that what has been spoken about about that area and what's the sentiment when we come to move into social intelligence where is where most of the companies that we work with are going is this social intelligence is the process of analyzing data sets in order to extract actionable insights that have an impact on on a business question so it's not a needle in a haystack kind of what's the social listening aspect of it it's more we've got that research question which will be set a research question so we can ask that same question in social data it's not a bit of social listening research if we frame the question and what we want to be able to do with that research then we're able to answer a lot of it within social data as well so let me bring this to life uh, for you so i've got four examples here of good practice um case studies not all case, there are other things I know about, but not all case studies can obviously be spoken about in public. So these ones are public facing and just provide a nice, a nice viewpoint on, on where the research can go. So the first one is in brand, is in brand positioning. We, we work with a company called Lingua Brand. So let me back up slightly, first of all. I do not do any social data analysis myself anymore. I champion the industry. So all the people and all the examples that I'm talking about here are brands and agencies that we work with. Um, and so I will mention them because it's their work rather than my work. I'm not trying to plug their services. I'm just showing kind of good, good examples here. So the first one is in brand positioning. And this particular case study was done from a company called Lingua Brand. Now, uh, Lingua Brand, they have their own technology, which is AI based, um, but it's not software as a service. It's part of a consultancy package. So they worked with um, Beam Suntroy, um, who have loads of kind of um, single malt. They've got loads of different whiskies and, and other alcoholic beverages as well. And what they wanted to do was um, redefine the brand positioning for each of the different whiskies. So they did a lot at the one time. Um, and the, uh, what Lingo Brand did is they analyzed visual and verbal cues from social data. So the Lingo Brand specialized in how people frame different um, brands and different concepts within their minds, um, because we all know that brands live in, in our heads. So they, they, use, they, under, they begin to understand what that framing looks like for someone. So by doing that, they were then able to use psychology to shape a very distinct tone of voice and personality for each of the different brands that they were looking at. So this project, it had quite a big impact for the companies. They shaped all of the strategies. So that was down from the positioning into the tone of voice, into the packaging design, and lots and lots more. And it was a very successful project for them. So again, this was all just done through social data. 
but what lingua brands are really good at doing is understanding what metrics it is that you need to measure to be able to get to that point so while this general social listening tools have all your share of voices and you can segment and cut data their lingua brands are very distinctive on what works and what doesn't work um, and they do the one thing moving on to the next one this was done um by this was done, this one, this case study was from one of our other partners called Listen and Learn Research. And they were helping a fashion apparel brand understand what green fashion is. So it's kind of quite an intangible concept, but what they wanted to do was understand what green means to people and then how to best then talk to customers about what that means. This one was an interesting study because they did a social intelligence element to begin with to start to understand about what these different framings look like. But then they worked with another agency and they then ran a, 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 a um, survey off the back of that to then drill more into some of these areas because we can't obviously social data is naturally occurring conversations and if something's not there then we can't analyze it so um sometimes you do need to go and ask other questions but it fits in really really nicely um with other research methods as well in terms of how we might want to build those out um so the next one is around managing customer experience now, in this one, this is one of the ones from the text analytics platforms. And what happened here was the, the, the it was a rideshare company that they were working with. You can probably guess who. Um, and they wanted to understand the emotional strength of the brand in real time. So they, the, the, brand, the rideshare service, they worked with conversion um, to specifically analyze the emotional um, output from from social media conversations. So those insights are used as part of kind of brand tracking strategies for them. And the you're able to identify crises and, and then as a result of that, be able to work with them more quickly. But then the Rideshare app also used a lot of this insight to direct internal transformation to improve performance and customer experience. There was a really nice case study as well from um, Word Nerds who worked with the DWP, and they were able to they were able to analyze it was purely Twitter conversations, and um, to understand where the feelings of a particular um, phone service um, was feeling, and then they created a, a new online platform that actually helped people get to the information that they were looking to get to earlier. Now the conversations in that after COVID kind of took a bit of a bad turn because then um, there was more people trying to use the service and things like that. So it's a great case study, but then something else shifted in the environment and, and changed up the conversation slightly. But they're working on fixing those from the Twitter conversations. So the study here with the Rideshare app, it has elements it has kind of different elements in there. You might only be doing one-off projects where something like having this in real time might not be possible for you. But we find that a lot of this work does fit nicely into those um, brand health study tracking projects. And the final one here, this is probably one of my favorite ones. So chocolate. I'm, I'm hoping that everybody can relate to this. I'm a bit of a chocoholic myself. So this was done by 113 Industries and they were working with a company. So what I didn't know is that most kind of chocolate products they they make around about kind of about a 50 million dollar product so 113 industries wanted to make one that was worth much more than that so it actually became to a like hundred thousand dollars in, in revenue this one so what they did is they analyzed social conversations to figure out when how and why people were consuming chocolate so they discovered the behaviors that were important and but what they found was there was a big change in the way people consume chocolate it was no longer like an unplanned impulse purchase and it was more of a planned purchase so for example when people were snacking in the evening the snack had to be indulgent meaning that all a lot of the time that chocolate wasn't making the cut because it just wasn't seen as being indulgent and it had to have a combination of flavors it also had to be salty and sweet um other findings that we found from that analysis was it needed to have a combination of textures which was smooth brittle and crunchy for them 
and um, it needed um, calories um, and sugar. So based upon the findings of all of this, they were then able to create a new sweet treat. And as a result of that analysis, just from social data, they were able to create a product that had a hundred million pound revenue, a uh, hundred million dollar even revenue, which I think is a great um, impact. So in summary, because I wanted to make this kind of half and half, so half talking and then half questions from you guys, is if you want social listening to work, do more than listen. You need to analyse and interpret that data. So we're talking not just sentiment, not just share of voice, but actually going in to answer questions. We always say at Social Intelligence Lab that tech is an enabler. Um, don't be layered by the functionality and its limitations on your research. A lot of the time, you do need to take it off platform and analyse it manually. We know that people in process are essential, um, but you already have a transferable skill set, so you should be able to do really good work in this area. So put your skill set to work instead of trying to make the tech work, because there's all sorts of different limitations there. There are also highly skilled professionals and agencies out there. Maybe you need to work with them rather than purchasing a tool. Um, learn what's possible as well from social intelligence rather than can we do a bit of social listening, please. Um, so we do keep quite a lot of case studies and things at the social intelligence lab and happy to walk you through those. Um, just a couple of places where you can get started with extra things. Um, I mentioned before that we have a social intelligence directory. So it's full of um, agencies and the different technologies out there. So there's over 250 in there just now, and we've got about another 500 to add in. So there's lots and lots and lots of, <laughs> of different ways in which you can analyze social data and technology providers out there. So I suggest that that's a great place to start if you're looking for something to see what's possible. Also, we run a social intelligence tech demo day every year. This is a combination. This year, we're not just doing technology. We are also doing a lot of kind of industry leading sessions as well. So in there, you'll find 12 demos of social data analysis technologies. So some of the ones that are demonstrating are NetBase, Enthesio, Audience. Who else is coming? Well, there's, there's, there's loads and loads more coming. We're also running workshops. So I gave a couple of case studies there. One was from Lingua Brand. They're going to be there doing a workshop on how it is that they analyze data, social data and other conversational data sources. And then I also mentioned Listen and Learn. And they're taking a great session on how to start to think about whether your research problem can be answered with social data and what that might look like. Um, we've also got four networking sessions, so you can speak to other folks that work in social data analysis. There's four panel sessions and two rounds tables, which are going to talk about big key issues like data ethics and governance, um, analyzing non-English data sources. Um, there's also things about how to kind of grow and scale social data analysis and you know, lots of other things in there as well. And then we've got two keynote speakers coming. Um, one of them I think is going to be on misinformation and disinformation, and then another one will be a brand case study. So that's on the 21st and 22nd of April. Um, there's 50% off tickets just now. So if you're looking for a general a general ticket, it's like $24.50. And if you'd like to partake in one of the workshops, it's $49. Um, so that is there, um, kind of very much focused in on what we've been talking about today. But I'm now happy to take any of your questions. Wow, that was uh, that was really interesting. Thank you, Gillian. Um, and we've got some quite a few questions coming through already. Uh, the first one here is um, it's more a statement, but maybe you can give feedback on it. So uh, this person has used social listening before, tried mm -hmm. to sell it to clients um, when they felt uh, it was needed, but the costs were quite prohibitive, and most um, I guess these are platforms would like long-term contracts which put clients off. So how have you got any advice to offer there in how do you uh, shoehorn or help clients to take the tentative first steps into social media listening? So I think, yeah, so the costs can, the cost can be staggering actually. Um, and it, you're talking about maybe like 1,000 pounds 
a month for some of the technologies and they want to tie it in for a year so it can when we're talking about as is being independent researchers that's a huge cost and the cost doesn't always translate it's the only way that we found that kind of works for quite a lot of this just now is for you initially to start partnering with another agency or freelancer who has access to, to the technologies and start to show them the potential for social listening and then, then work with them in terms of building that out more. It's easier with like case studies like the Rideshare app because it's day in day out constantly monitoring but when we're going in to answer questions we know it's tough we are trying to work on we've been working with some of the enterprise companies um because they're all starting to build social intelligence functions internally which still have to go and get other parts of the business to to work with them so we're working with them to to show the ways in which how that has been working which hopefully will then translate back into us being able to make a better case for social listening for you guys as well okay uh, another question um how does the new ios 14.5 impact social listening so there was there, so there was a change so actually it impacted brand watch and their one of their products quite substantially which had to be pulled from the market so that was called curiously which was more of a an app where you you would ask questions and people would come back and answer it so it was almost like a survey in terms of how it's impacted the social data analysis from here and um, we're, we're seeing that no one none of the vendors that we work with are reporting any kind of any problems with that at all just now it was just that one brand watch product that had the, the challenge Okay. Um, one specific one of the, about the Beam Suntory uh, case study you spoke to us about. Where did they get the social data from? Which specific sources? Do you know that? I do not know all of the sources that was used in that. Mm -hmm. I, I do have the case. I do have the case study actually written out. And um, so I'm more than happy to share that with with you, Sally, and then you can forward it on to everyone. Okay. Brilliant. Um, somebody else says this is a really useful session thanks Gillian do any of the platforms also include search data and what is your recommendation for the best source of data and analysis platform for search so for search searches search and social really are um, we say great bedfellows um but it feels sorry it feels really cheesy um so we there is I know that Pulsar have search integrated into their system um, but what we tend to find is that people are using two separate platforms for this. So you can use your general social listening technology to do all the social stuff. But if you're looking for the search data, um, there is a platform called Answer the Public. And it seems to be very popular with our practitioners that we work with. OK, another one. Uh, what's the difference between listening and monitoring or is that analysing? It's much of a muchness listening and monitoring. So I think you, when when people tend to talk about monitoring, when we've looked at how they, we built a maturity model recently, and when people mentioned monitoring, they, we found that monitoring would tend to be more people were monitoring their their own their own pieces of content, so their their um, owned data, and they were monitoring to see what was happening with that. Whereas when people were listening, they were starting to listen to the broader conversations that maybe were completely directed to them so there was it's just it's just slight semantics really okay uh, so another one relating to beam suntory um jill loved your examples beam suntory example data must have been using brand names of relevant whiskies is that right not but just brand names no um okay. so the way so this is another this is another thing in this area so everybody kind of starts and every brand they always want to know they tend to want to know what people are saying about them but actually there's you get more value from the data when you start to analyze different product categories so i know i know a little bit about this this example and they they went to analyze how people it's framing whiskey in general it starts with and then going down into the different brands so it's not just about the particular brand but it does go wider than that and in com comparing and contrasting with other types of alcohol like gin or rum things like that okay so that seems to answer the follow-on bit which was 
do real people typically use brand names on their social media feeds? So I think you've answered that by going out broader than drilling yeah. down into the brands. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, we, we tend to find that most of the conversation doesn't focus on the brand. Um, it focuses more on the activities that people are doing. So you do need to go into product category. Yeah, okay. Uh, chocolate study, was it really about when and how people buy or was it about what people said about when and how they buy? So it was the self-reported, so they were talking about their purchases and how they consume difference. It didn't just look at chocolate, that one looked at snacking in general. So they, they made a, from what I know, again, I, I've got this one and I can share the actual case study with you. Um, what, from what I know about it, they took it in and they had a look at a snacking journey. So they broke it down into kind of customer journey focus um, and they looked at, they, they analysed at different points on that to kind of find, figure out where people, why, when, why and how people were snacking. Okay, uh, in your experience, is social intelligence a useful research tool for someone who predominantly works in niche or B2B markets? Or do you really have to have the high volume of social engagement that comes with working with larger consumer markets for it to be workable? No, it's a, good, it's a great question, actually. So there's a bit of a fallacy, more data means more insight doesn't really. So what we're looking for is for to be able to get the right quality and relevant data. So there's a few studies out there that say that if it, one of them came from a company called Black Swan and they say that a, 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 like under 50% of the data that they gather through social listening is relevant for the questions that they're answering. Um, we've got other studies from other providers like Conversion that say that can be somewhere between 10 and 16%. So while there's massive amounts of data for consumer products and services, there it's not all of the same quality. When we're doing it within the B2B context, it's still completely possible. Um, we you just need to kind of go in to find find out where people are talking about these specific things that you want to answer questions about. So it does require a little bit of upfront work to find the right data source, but once you've got it, you should be able to get qualitative insights from it. That's reassuring, good. Um, okay, so it would be great to know more about how to frame questions with social listening, sorry, which social listening Intel can help with, especially at the more achievable end of the budget. So any research question you have and that you're trying to answer, I would imagine you'll be able to answer it also with social data. Okay, that's very clear. Um, so somebody is requesting to see the case studies. Are these things that can be shared in detail? Yes, I, yes, I, I can share what we've got. Um, they're not always massive amounts of detail, but I can share what we have um, and I'll send those on to you after the webinar, Sally. Fantastic. Uh, and then um, the last question so far, unless anybody else has got um, any more questions they want to feed through. Uh, more data does not mean more insight. Can we quote you on that? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Any more questions, anybody, before we call this to an end? No, I think that's I think that's about it. So thank you very much indeed, Gillian, for um, taking the time to walk us through that. Really has been very eye opening. Um, uh, and um, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to everybody for joining and listening in today we hope you found it interesting and i think it just remains to say thanks again Gillian, and have a wonderful afternoon everyone that's great thank you very much for having me um any i'll send those case studies across to sally and if anyone has any questions please do just reach out thank you very much bye bye, bye.